You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. This episode is somewhat unique and calls for a different kind of introduction. Picture, if you will, a zoo exhibit that's lit by the stars. Everything around you goes missing with every step. You get chills from the sense that this jungle is alive with creatures that you can see disappear. One thing's for certain, they are always watching you. Which means you've crossed over into Animals of the Night. Today on Zoo Tours, we are back once again for one of my favorites for another special episode of Tennessee's Memphis Zoo. All right, so why is it so special this time? People like to visit zoos for their lions, elephants, and other big name animals. No, 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 no. You should be visiting animals that are moving around when the lights are out. The Memphis Zoo's Animals of the Night has been around since 1995, and it's still one of the few nocturnal houses in America. Now why would you want to go see animals in the dark? Doesn't that defeat the purpose of a zoo? No. You want to because nocturnal houses are famous for having some of the coolest, creepiest in a good way, and the rarest animals in the world. Before we begin, if this is your first time here, please consider liking, subbing, and hitting that bell icon so you can be first in line for our tours. Your journey under the stars will kick off if you just head straight from this obelisk and towards the old Carnivora building, which is now a restaurant. To the right of that is the most entertaining Gibbon duo I've ever come across. The restaurant lets you look into their exhibit so they can come right up to you while you eat. But since they're part of the Primate Canyon, we'll see more of them at another time. Well, they're actually more of like the Primate Canyon's preview since Animals of the Night is between them and the rest of the primates. If you couldn't tell by some of the intro footage, the daytime cycle stays on for the first hour and a half when the zoo opens, and like every nocturnal house. Ironically, the animals are way more active with the lights on. But it didn't matter what time it was. You'll never miss the three-banded armadillo. This is Tank, and he's covered in armor. The top layer of the shell is made of keratin, the same protein that's found in our hair and nails, but underneath it's fused with a hard layer of tiled bones. Since it's not actually attached to the skin both ways, they can tuck their heads, legs, and tails into a ball. Now Tank's kind is native to South America, but his roommates are from East Asia. The Pygmy Slowloris is a kind of tree-dwelling primate. It's not a monkey, and the lack of a visible tail gives the idea that they're an ape. Like lemurs, lorises are prosimians. What makes them so special is, in a way, they literally have a trick up their sleeve. They can secrete a fluid from a gland that's near their elbows. It contains allergens, but it's not actually toxic until it mixes with their saliva. So when they bite, it's laced with venom that's powerful enough to rot flesh. Right next door lives not a potato, according to Google, but a pado, another prosimian and the largest member of the Loris family, except they live in Central and West African rainforests. The Loris and the pado have a special network of blood vessels in their hands and feet, which gives them a super strength, long lasting grip. Pados have spiny, almost protruding vertebrae in their neck. Some sources will tell you that it's for defense, while others will say that area is actually very sensitive and only used for peaceful social interactions, such as rubbing necks with other potos. We'll skip this for now since they're exhibited elsewhere, and move our attention to the beautiful, the gracious, the legendary boa guard, the six-banded armadillo. Wait, let me check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep, six-banded armadillo. They can actually have between six and eight bands. There's 20 kinds of armadillos, and what's really amazing is that they're all pretty much easy to tell apart. Six-bandeds are 
a little thicker than others. So no, they can't roll into a ball for protection. But what they can do is what Tank doesn't do. Boa Guard can dig. They do have the hard shells, but their best plan of defense is to run to its burrow. Oh, and just to let you know, you're not seeing double. A lot of the back walls in here are lined with mirrors, so that way you can still see the animals even if they have their backs turned towards you. I said the other day that South American animals are so great because they seem to mix well with a lot of other animals. Well, Boa Guard is at your feet. In the canopy is the Lin's Two-Toed Sloth. Finally, we finally filmed a sloth that wasn't catching some Z's. Their fur varies from gray to brown, but if you ever see a green sloth, it's well assumed they have a symbiotic relationship with algae, fungi, and even moths, which means they all help each other out. When a sloth goes to the ground to do their business, moths will lay eggs in their poop. Doesn't sound very beneficial to the sloth, but the more moths they have on their fur, the more nitrogen there will be, allowing more algae to grow. Not only do the sloths eat the algae, but that green coat gives them extra camouflage. Bugs aren't the only thing that they help out. They also lend their fur to some very bug-eyed creatures. The Owl Monkey. Or if you're in a mood to make it sound like you're making up animals, you can also call them the Dura Coolie. They have a very distinct look. To be able to see in low light, they evolved large disproportionate eyeballs. There are many primates who go to bed when you're eating breakfast, but Buttercup and her friends are considered the only true nocturnal monkey. There's 11 species that are found in South America, and Memphis signs theirs as the three-striped night monkey, apparently the only one in an AZA zoo. Going around her first corner, now it's time for Africa to show us what their larger nightlife is like. Say hello to the aardvark. Long tail, long snout, and famous for eating ants. They must be related to anteaters, right? Well, every zoo visitor seems to think so. Even though aardvark means earth pig, in the last episode we very briefly got a hint that they are classified in the same order as hyraxes, elephants, manatees, and more. Aardvarks like to be alone most of the time unless they want to make some babies. Boss and Sunshine did just that. They welcomed Grogu, a wrinkled, hairless bundle of joy. Cubs are usually born just three pounds and inside a burrow, and it really only takes about six months for them to become independent. So when I went, Grogu had an exhibit all to himself. Boss and Sunshine. Now they still live with babies. Bush babies, to be exact, that are fully grown. So, why the name? Well, just have a listen. Now you know, if you ever hear a baby screaming in the middle of an African forest, it's not actually a baby or a demon. The bush babies or the Galego's hind legs have unusually long stretchy tendons that might as well act like springs. They can leap seven feet in the air, 12 times their body length, and or cover 30 feet in just a few seconds. Combine their Olympic jumping skills with those bat-like ears, and insects don't stand a chance. Or their actual favorite food, which is apparently acrylic. The two most beloved animals of the night live in one exhibit. Be sure to look down for Kindlin, their southern hairy-nosed wombat. They're native to southern Australia, where it can get a little warm, so they like places that are easy for them to dig and stay cool. A wombat burrow can be nearly 12 feet deep, 150 feet long, and have multiple tunnels, chambers, and it's so large that it acts like a hotel for other outside wombats and other species. Wombats are mostly solitary, but if he wanted to hang out with his roommate, he would need to learn how to climb trees. I'm referring to Shemp, the bear cuscus. I don't even know where to begin with this one, but I can tell you that him and Kindlin have one big thing in common. They are both marsupials, which of course means that the females can carry their infants in their belly pouch like a kangaroo. He looks like a bunch of different animals sewn together. 
They have the build and thick fur like a bear. They have the eyes and the stare like a lemur. And its naked tail, well, that gives away their lineage. They're related to possums, not opossum. I said a few months ago, I always wanted to show you a mammal put its prehensile tail to good use. I just didn't think that Shemp would be the one to demonstrate. Their tail is almost as long as the rest of their body. Half of it is practically hairless to give them a better grip on branches, and it's at least strong enough to support 20 pounds. This tail and their very long claws are the main keys to living in the canopy of the Sulawesi rainforests, a habitat that they're losing to deforestation, and cocoa farmers see them as crop raiders, which makes the cuscus officially a vulnerable species, but they are an extremely rare species in zoos. I found one source that claims only four zoos in the world hold them, and one in North America, meaning there's a giant chance that Shemp will be the first and only cuscus on zoo tours. Shemp may be the rarest animal in the building, but there's still a lot of other animals left that you still won't find in many zoos. Or even better, animals that you never expect to find in a nocturnal house. The Texas Blind Salamander strictly lives in water-filled caves. Since they live in complete darkness, their eyes have been reduced to two black dots under their skin. But if you couldn't guess by their name, they do not allow the salamander to see. But that doesn't stop them from being very active predators. As it moves its head side to side on the bottom, it can sense the slightest changes to the pressure in still waters and pick up any sort of movement before they make their attack on snails, shrimp, and other invertebrates. Consider yourself lucky if you've ever seen a large spotted genet, which actually has two exhibits. It looks like the zoo improvised a bit by combining this with this with an overhead tube. Overhead features have become a zoo trend, well, at least in America. 99% of the time, they're made for cats. But no matter how many times you hear a guest say it, this is not a cat. There are 17 kinds of genets, spread throughout many parts of Africa's savannas and woods. One species is found in Southwest Europe. The large spots cover a small portion of South Africa. Now, why should you be so lucky to see one? I'd say that only around four or five AZA zoos let you get this close to the large spotted genet. Now, they may be as agile as a cat, and I guess they look like one too, and they're related to them, but they are in the same family as civets. Very much like the civet relative that lives in here. The bearcat or binturong. They trek the treetops of Southeast Asia and also get around by using powerful claws and a prehensile tail. They are one of two carnivores in the world that have one. They're classified as carnivores, but they mostly stick to their veggies and fruit. And from what I've read, bonsai loves bananas. What's the other carnivore that has a prehensile tail? Well, you'll find out pretty soon. So far we've met a few creatures that know how to burrow underground, but here's an adorable group that pretty much only lives underground. We talked about how every naked mole rat colony has workers, soldiers, and a queen, the only female that's allowed to breed in the colony. But according to the zoo's site, they don't have one. I'm not entirely sure how it works with this colony, Usually when queens are either removed or they pass away, a subordinate female will become fertile, or collectively, the females will have an all-out war to get the crown. Speaking of adorable, I have never seen such a large colony of common vampire bats. Memphis has so-so amount, but imagine seeing 1,000 of these bat boys flying above your head. For those who don't know, vampires don't directly suck blood. They use their teeth to make small incisions and lick up the blood from the wound. And it's so soft and gentle, the victim actually might not even notice. They don't have the best reputation, but they're a lot friendlier than they look. They need to feed at least every two days to survive. So if one of them fails to find food, 
Another bat will regurgitate some of the blood that they ate and give their hungry friend some of their leftovers. To kick off the third corner of Animals of the Night is the dynamic duo of Dixie and Zoe, the mother-daughter pair of African crested porcupines. Well, the zoo's website calls them crested, but the scientific name lists them as cape porcupines. Maybe a local can weigh in on the confusion. When I looked up at their sign, it changed and also showed the profile of a lovable genet-sized species that also lives next door. And they even have their own overhead tube. Like the genet, it takes them into the middle of one of these column exhibits. They, I believe, are home to Gil the Ringtail. Gil was found in a freight that was hauled from New Mexico all the way to Mississippi. When the truck driver found him, he thought he was hauling a ringtail lemur, and he contacted a nearby wildlife rehab center, and Gil eventually made his way to Memphis. To give context to the story, ringtails are native to Mexico, the South and Southwestern United States, and not Mississippi. They're also not lemurs or any kind of primate, nor are they a kind of cat. As we learned in the card above, ringtails are in the same family as raccoons. I really, really wish I could debut the Tamandua and start by explaining how amazing it smelled right here. But unfortunately, they weren't cooperating. The last exhibit in the corner is where I did end up seeing Grogu the Aardvark. Alright, we just have one more hallway and you're free to go. Cause you're not gonna want to miss an exhibit with four species. With another six-banded armadillo, I didn't see, two sloths instead of one, and the red rumped agouti. Agoutis are guinea pig-like rodents, and you know who loves guinea pig-like rodents? Jaguars. If they see a threat, they'll freeze. But if that doesn't work, they can outrun just about anything that's after them, and keep up a good sprint for hours. And if they need to, this medium-sized rodent can jump six feet in the air from a standing position. Did I say that four species lived in here? I did say four. Oh yeah, the fourth we actually skipped by the Pottos, and that displayed a Kingaju. The last time we saw one of these, they were sleeping in the corner of a smoothie shop. Click on the card if you want to see if I'm telling the truth. Their scientific name means the Golden Drinker because of their golden brown coat and their love of nectar. I can finally say that they are the other of the two carnivores that has a prehensile tail. While they do like eggs and insects, what they're really after are mixed fruits and honey. Based on their looks, this is the one time when I really don't mind if someone thinks that they're some kind of monkey, but even some of you might be really surprised to know that kinkajus are in the very same family as kuwadis, ringtails, and therefore also raccoons. The answer is yes. I've been ignoring this until now. You first come across this exhibit by the aardvarks. It nearly covers the entire length of the building and goes right down the middle of the guest path. So you can walk on its right and then go around to its left and it even extends further into a much larger cave. It holds a constant, massive swarm of bats. Well, not just bats, three kinds of bats. A majority are Siba's short tails, greater bulldogs, and somewhere around here is the Egyptian fruit bat. The first two are from Central and South America, while the third, well, you can take a good guess. Despite this, the signage is really all about bats in Tennessee. The nearly 10,000 documented caves make the volunteer state an ideal landscape for bats. The sign says the state has 16 species, and they're all important to the ecosystem no matter what people think of them. They keep the insect population in check. I guess bats don't sound too bad after all, now do they? The last sign talks about how you can help them. Populations are declining across the states from deforestation and vandalized caves, but you can donate to the Nature Conservancy that gates up caves from vandals, and Bat Conservation International monitors diseases that kills millions of bats every year. Or to take action into your own hands, much like the zoo did here, you can install a bat house and offer them a safe haven to roost. 
Remember the pygmy slow loris? Well, this next animal is pygmy and slow, but it's the red slender loris. They do look very similar, but their arms have given them the nickname banana on stilts. And it really does look like they wouldn't hesitate to call their food their precious. They eat berries, lizards, and are even able to digest toxic ants and beetles. But in order to do that, they pee on their hands. And it's believed that this will mask or match the chemical compounds of these toxic bugs, so they don't attack the loris. Now talk about another rarity. Again, the Memphis Zoo is only one of a few places in the world that cares for the slender loris. And apparently only one of two in the United States. And I want you to tell me what the other institution is. Our last resident is just another one of those nocturnal creatures that most of you will probably never get to see. The banded palm civet. With all this talk of civets, we're just now finally seeing one. The banded palm civet is found in the tropical jungles of Southeast Asia. At night, they're on the hunt for locusts, worms, crustaceans, and coffee plants. I don't know if this applies to all civets, but there are blends of coffees that recycle the beans from their droppings. I did read these digested beans make the coffee lose its bitterness. And of course, it's the most expensive cup of joe you'll ever have. So why will most of you never see one of these? When the Cincinnati Zoo's last civet passed away a few years ago, it was believed by many that it was the last of its kind in America. As of 2022, at least four institutions in America have them, but only one has successfully bred the civet. However, Memphis is the only one for now that lets the public see theirs. I say it's the last species because the prehensile-tailed porcupine wasn't having it. And our very last fellow night owl is a second large spotted genet. And that Jacks, Jills, and Joeys was the channel's first full-length feature of a nocturnal house where a good portion of it was filmed in the dark. And you could actually see the animals. It's not every day that you get the privilege of exploring a zoo exhibit where it's difficult to see your feet. And even better, it's not every day you get to appreciate creatures you will most likely never see again in your life. I want you to let me know your favorite animal of the night. And besides Omaha, let me know what other nocturnal houses deserve a feature. I want to thank you all for watching Zoo Tours. See if you can answer this episode's trivia question. And as always, stay wild.